the lady here uh, the hand up. Oh, I was just going to say, having grown up, my dad's an obstetrician and I'm a veterinarian. And, um, you know, looking at when we're talking about, you know, the birth process and humans and animals, I think we have to also remember that evolution has been essentially sidestepped because a hundred years ago, the death rate in human birth was about 25%. So we probably would have stoked heads. <laughs> You know, so when you've got a six foot four uh, Dutchman having a child with a f tiny little woman, you know, they, they, it wouldn't have happened. And when I'm asked to do a C-section on a bulldog with, you know, nature doesn't do that. We went, oops, sorry, <laughs> mistake. But we, we intervene, so the natural process is being mm -hmm. interfered with. And in the, you know, the antibiotic question, the unfortunate simple answer for that is money. So it's, it's production rates and money. Like it's, it's a huge controversy within the whole veterinary industry, but it's money. Mm -hmm. So the two comments were um, the fact that we've sidestepped evolution to, by natural selection in humans to some extent because we are able to do C-sections and maybe we would have a different outcome if that weren't the case. And for, in agriculture, the fact that still using antibiotics is purely economic. Yeah. Did you have a comment about that? Yeah so, yeah, so I think actually that the use of C-sections could be a problem because it may end up being that Eventually, we are going to need C-sections more and more because we are not having this sort of control of evolution by natural selection by preventing the birth of too much of a disconnect between the size of the head of the baby and the size there, of the There are brains problem. of animals that cannot breed naturally or be born naturally, period. Bulldogs have to have artificial insemination and cannot be born naturally, period. So the comment was that there are actually breeds that we've created mm -hmm. um, that cannot breed or give birth naturally, which I had no idea and it's very spooky. The woman behind you in the, in the blue? And then at the back, yeah, after. I yeah. wanted to know if there, what research has been done on the worm hypothesis and autoimmune diseases. So the, the mm -hmm. question was what research has been done on the worm hypothesis, and especially in relation to autoimmune disease, and I want to know the answer too. Mm -hmm. So the same group of investigators who are looking at hay fever, they are also looking at asthma, and they are also looking at Crohn's disease. So they are, they are looking at, and, and I think that it's going to be something similar. I think there's going to be a similarly protective effect of worm therapy against the autoimmune diseases. Yeah. And, and the other autoimmune I think something I am not really familiar with, I think uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome is the other one that we're looking at. Yeah. But uh, potentially it could be used for any autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why don't we all know about this? Why, is this why, why are we just hearing about it tonight? Why isn't it in the news everywhere? It, it has been in the news. That's actually where I saw this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no. wait, wait. How many people knew about the worm thing? Put up your hand. Be honest. All right, 5%, so just so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, be, because people know that I teach this course, I often get sent links. Did you see this? Did you see that? So it's usually research that is being published in some scientific journal that is being picked up by the press. So it may be an article published in, say, Science Magazine that uh, then later on shows up in the New York Times, and then I hear about it from there, and then I go to the science article. Mm -hmm. There was a question right at the back there, yeah? larger brain size as a result of having a larger cranial uh, size. So over time, uh, and this can be you know, various lengths of time, but over time you would have a, a difference between people born um, in societies where the capacity for C-section exists and those societies in which, uh, for lack of uh, medical care and, and ability, Money. Uh, the, the, that limitation of brain size is very much still in, in force. So what could that mean in terms of, of um, shall we say, intelligence as it relates to cranial size and, and that disparity existing between different societies in accordance to their access to medical uh, Okay, so we can do the one question at a time just for the video camera. So the question, the question was, the uh, scenario was that in societies with lots of C-sections, uh, there may be 
babies born with bigger brains than would otherwise be born, and therefore the average brain size might go up if we follow the argument of evolution by natural selection, um, compared to uh, societies where C-sections were not performed. So there's sort of an open-ended question, is that possible, and what are the ramifications for that? Do you want to say something? And, and then the question, well, whether that would affect sort of intelligence. So even though... Um, there is evidence that differences across species translate in differences in intelligence. So between primates and other primates and humans or other animals and humans, difference in brain size does tr translate into differences in cognitive abilities. There is no evidence within the species that brain size is necessarily correlated with greater intelligence. So larger brains necessarily correlated with greater intelligence. So it may actually not really necessarily relate to producing more intelligent babies by having larger brains within humans. And you had a second question? Yes, the second question relates to autoimmune, uh, to the autoimmune response and immunity in general, uh, uh, baby cells were described, where uh, they can actually accelerate their own uh, rate of mutation. Um, in the same system, in the same immune, immune system, you've got other um, memory cells that have very conserved, um, um, very conserved, uh, antigen response cells uh, where, where there's practically no change occurring because your defense response depends on that change not occurring. So how is it that that system can, can, can uh, contain these two very contradicting um, types of um, evolutionary processes, if you like, and, and yet uh, keep them uh, keep them from messing up each other's activity and sort of making a general mess of the whole thing? Okay. 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 So the the uh, the question was, how can you have uh, in the same system two things called B cells? We talked about B cells and T cells, where at one stage the B cells are um, hyper mutable. There's lots. There's mutations. There's actually they're engineered by natural selection to mutate a lot. And then you and then you also have they turn into memory cells, which then are very stable and don't mutate. Is that is that correct? So question is sort of from a evolutionary perspective, how does that work? Okay, so I, I have to say that the immune system is a very, very complex system and I'm by no means an expert on it. So I can only guess at the moment what the answer might be. I would have to look it up. I think that they, it, it, these, those cells are going to be in different developmental stages. So the ones that undergo a lot of mutation are at some earlier, earlier stage of development of the, 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 those tissues and that's the time when these uh, highly mutable cells are present. But those that have already differentiated all the way to B cells, uh, I suspect that they are going to be very restricted in terms of how much they, they divide, just enough to maintain the population, a viable population of those cells. And by that point, there may be mechanisms that have already suppressed the high mutability. Another answer that is just coming to my mind right now, but I'm not sure whether this is correct or not. Once they have undergone this process of recombination, they have already eliminated all the other possible segments, gene segments to produce that variable region. So they no longer have that possibility. But the um, original B cells that give rise to those already start with the whole repertoire of possible genes. And so those are the ones that can re recombine and mutate. But right now, I'm really only guessing I would have to go look it up and see whether that's actually correct or not. If, if, if there is anybody that is familiar with immunology here, maybe, maybe can help me with the answer to this. I don't know. No? OK. <laughs> no. Um, other questions? Charles, lady. This, this fellow here, yes. Um, in relation to the hookworm therapy, for the people who participated in the study, if any of them dewormed themselves, did the autoimmune illness return? Did it return at the same intensity? What was the prognosis for them after they dewormed themselves? So the question is, in the worm study, um, those people who did deworm, so everyone took worms, and the idea is that they got better. Now, for those who dewormed themselves, what happened? Did they get their diseases back, and at what rate? Yeah, I, I think to be protected, you have to have the worms. So once you're rid of the worms, you go back to where you were before. Yeah, that's my guess. That's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, yes. So is it only hookworms that work? Is it only hookworms that work? Are there nicer yeah, worms? Pro probably not, but I think they chose hookworms because they are not that 
bad, I guess, you know, they don't reproduce within yourself and they don't have very nasty effects if you don't have that many of them. But I suspect it, pretty much any kind of worm would work. Mm -hmm. And they're cute, obviously. That's another reason. Yes.